Nominations are now open for the Bioceuticals Integrative Medicine Awards. The Beamers recognise professionals who demonstrate excellence in the complementary and integrative medicine profession. Nominate your deserving practitioner now by going to bioceuticals.com.au and clicking on the Education tab. FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us on the line today is Dr. Genevieve Steiner. Her research spans the early detection, prevention, and treatment of cognitive decline in older age, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia. Dr. Steiner uses neuroimaging and physiological research methods to explore the brain's function and structure to discover biomarkers and test new treatment strategies for cognitive decline with a focus on herbal medicine. She is leading the world's first clinical trial in evaluating the effect of cannabidiol on cognition in people with early stage Alzheimer's disease. She is a young tall poppy science awardee, an NHMRC ARC Dementia Research Development Fellow. She leads the Nickham Health Research Institute's Clinical Laboratory at Western Sydney University, is President of the Australasian Society for Psychophysiology and Deputy Director of the Sydney Partnership for Health, Education, Research and Enterprise, that's SPHERE. Warmly, I welcome you to FX Medicine, Dr Genevieve Steiner, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Andrew. Genevieve, you have done a heck of a lot already in your in your career, but I've got to ask you, what where did your interest in herbal medicine spark? That's a really good question, Andrew. I think my interest in herbal medicine probably started back in around 2010 when I was first starting to look at, at, at research into brain function and in memory function specifically. And I came across some early work from the Swinburne group. Right? You're probably familiar with, with people like Con Stow and Andrew Papinga. Yes, and Andrew yep. Scully, yep. that's right, yeah. And some of the work that they were doing around Brahmi. And I just found it so fascinating to see that herbal medicine could have these what we call psychopharmacological effects on the brain. So people would take these, um, take some Brahmi and then they'd look at recording their brain function and see dramatic changes um, over the course of just a few hours. And that really grabbed me in quite early and I thought this is something I'd really like to explore for my future research career and I guess, yeah, 10 years-ish later, <laughs> yeah. here I am kind of doing something like that. Um, so they've got some really neat neuroimaging um, machines down there and, and this is like they can detect changes r r quite rapidly upon mm -hmm. oral administration of various, um, various therapies. So where does this sit with regards to physiological effect and clinical effect? Mm, it's a really good question. We, we're we using some similar techniques at Western Sydney University. So we record EEG or electroencephalography, which is basically looking at the uh, neural activity of the brain. And it allows you to image the brain or image, look at the brain's function down to millisecond accuracy. So what you're asking about is this intersection between what's going on in the brain and these rapid brain changes that you can see after just a few hours and how that's actually associated with cognition. And yeah. I think what, what it does is, is it's interesting because, you know, over the years the, the ways of measuring changes in our memory and thinking has really evolved quite quite rapidly in the last 10 to 20 years. We used to always just do things on pen and paper testing. So you can think about your sort of standard IQ test that you might have been given, you know, 10 or 20 years ago where you just sit down and fill out this form and paper and someone might be timing you with a stopwatch. 
But nowadays we're doing these kinds of tests on computers, so you mm. can actually get, you know, probe cognition and cognitive function quite accurately and um, specifically by recording people's reaction times and their responses on screens, and we're even using iPads now as well. Wow. So we're getting a much more sort of fine-grained measurement of people's cognitive abilities, and then actually mapping the brain function changes onto that onto that actually gives another kind of level of depth to what's going on because you can see the neural activity that's underpinning the cognitive responses and being able to record both of those things down to that millisecond accuracy, accuracy scale is is quite powerful so you can measure changes quite uh, quite well now and quite accurately in terms of clinical improvement, I think that's really down to, you know, what disorder it is you're actually looking at and the kind of treatment you're looking at and then what you would say is the most relevant or important difference or what we call the clinically meaningful difference that you're trying to detect in patients. We're going to be talking about dementia and cognitive impairment today. Um, mm -hmm. I guess before we go on to that, though, do, do you think with regards to the advances of technology, you know, you were mentioning iPads before and the mm. way that we interact with that, has medicine caught up with the way that they're assessing cognitive impairment? Or are we still using these old, you know, gold standards, which are decades old? Yeah, that's a really good question. And the answer is yes and no. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Research is always going to be, I think, a few steps ahead of what we're doing in clinical practice. Right. Um, it does take quite a while for things to catch up and to really have you know, an effect to change the, the medical paradigm and what we're doing. And a really good example of that is is diet, for example. You know, research has been showing for a long, long time that, you know, eating things like healthy fats, et cetera, are really quite good for our health and our brain and our heart. But you would have seen, I think it was last week now, um, that Australian the Australian Dietary Guidelines has only just changed to incorporate that and say, yeah. it's fine, you can eat full-fat dairy. So that's been a good example for you of how the medical paradigm is quite, you know, a few steps behind the research paradigm. And it's really no different when it comes to dementia as well. Um, one of the uh, issues that we have in dementia is that, you know, there's, it's a very complex syndrome. It's it's not a one disease in itself. It's mm. actually a syndrome that comprises more than 100 different diseases. So diagnosing dementia or various sorts of dementia can be quite tricky because you don't just have a blood test that you can do like you would with diabetes, for example. You've got to do quite a comprehensive um battery of tests that would essentially exclude other causes of, of cognitive dysfunction and brain dysfunction that might be contributing to the problems that you see in the patient. So accessing the technology required and the, um, the resources required to do those kind of tests is very, is very difficult. It's also very expensive. And we don't have a lot of access to those things in Australia um, for, for, for a patient care point of view. So if we talk about Alzheimer's, say, one of our kind of hallmarks that you would use to diagnose Alzheimer's disease is the build-up of the amyloid protein or amyloid pathology in the brain. And I guess our gold standard way of measuring that in research setting is to give someone an amyloid PET scan or do a lumbar puncture to say, well, we've got amyloid present in the cerebrospinal fluid. But if you were, you know, John Smith on the street in his mid-70s living in say, you know, Western Sydney, the likelihood of you being able to access those mm. types of biomarkers yeah. is just second, like it's minimal. You know, yeah. we just don't, don't do it. It's, it's expensive. So yes, technology is moving at a rapid pace. Research is moving at a rapid pace, but, you know, we're so far behind in terms of what we're doing from the medical point of view and from a patient care perspective in, in terms of diagnosing and evaluating treatments, um, you know, from a patient care perspective. So with regards to diagnosis in the everyday clinic, how's that made with regards to dementia and indeed Alzheimer's? Mm, good question. And it really varies depending on the resources that are available. So you might be, say, someone living in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, and forgive me for being so Sydney-centric with <laughs> our discussion. <laughs> it's the best parallel I can give you right now. Yeah. So you might be living in, say, uh, the eastern suburbs of Sydney, and you would be seeing a, a you know, a, a, a geriatrician or a neurologist or, a, or an old, an old age psychiatrist there, and you may be able to go in and say, well, that's that's no problem. We'll we'll uh, we'll give you these these certain 
tests of cognitive function. So they might do some pen and paper tests with you and then they might send you for an MRI and say, well, you've got some changes in the volume of your brain. And then, you know, if you're lucky, you might even go and get a PET scan as well to say, well, your brain's not actually performing at fantastic metabolic efficiency. So you've probably got Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, that compared to say a patient who lives in Campbelltown where they don't even have an MRI scanner, you know, they'll be lucky to get some pen and paper tests. They might get a CT scan, which, you know, really doesn't show a lot. And that's probably about it. Right. So it varies very, very widely depending on where you are. Um, but it typically takes, uh, you know, a good few months for a patient to get diagnosed um, with some degree of accuracy in Australia. The Dementia Australia statistics say that it actually takes up to five years for a diagnosis and that includes the, the time that it takes uh, for the families to get to get people who are experiencing memory and thinking changes into a doctor as well. Yeah, and, and when you're talking about, you know, dementia incorporating over, over 100 diseases and then mm. you're, you're talking about diagnosing that with, you know, dare I be so <laughs> recalcitrant as saying pen and paper <laughs> diagnosis and clinical diagnosis and not having any definitive um, differentiation, then it could very well be coded as the wrong diagnosis, i.e. when you go into hospital, each disease has a code. And if you're given the wrong code, then that's the statistics, the accepted statistics for the prevalence of that disease. Mm, that's correct. Um, so... It's, I think there's there's two two points to kind of pull out there, Andrew. One is around um, the 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 correct way of diagnosing it, mm. um, and I think that you know from a patient care perspective, if you're not diagnosing it correctly, it means you may not access the correct treatments yeah. for it, which is yeah. obviously a danger. And that does happen. We do see a lot of cases, uh, you know, of, of misdiagnosis or incorrect diagnosis, and a lot of that comes down to. Um, what technologies are available at the time the diagnosis is made, uh, the clinician's experience and also their comfort with making the diagnosis mm -hmm. and the type of clinician that does it because, you know, we've done some work with GPs, for instance, um, who are, you know, obviously the patient's first uh, point at which they access the healthcare system on their dementia journey, you could say. Mm. And GPs often don't feel very confident with diagnosing dementia, even though some of them do make the diagnosis. Um, and sometimes they do it incorrectly. So they may say, oh, you've got vascular dementia or Alzheimer's or just don't even give them a, <laughs> a type of dementia. Um, you know, so that's one aspect of the picture. The other aspects around the coding that you mentioned, and in Australia, we code for dementia itself. So, you know, in terms of like the AIHW, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare yep. statistics and the reports that come out, we tend to just talk about dementia, you know, as a syndrome right. rather than differentiating, delineating, you know, Alzheimer's, vascular, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, in terms of reporting, it's not such a big problem here at the moment, although it would be nice to be able to see the different. Australian-based prevalences of the various types of dementia because we don't really do that particularly well here. Gotcha. That may, it may improve in the future. Um, there was a, a big grant that came out of the federal government, uh, I think it was announced last year now, for a, a, an initiative called ADNET. So it's the Australian Dementia Network, which is linking together all of the memory clinics across Australia. And what that will help to do is provide a dementia registry. So we'll be able to be coding people for their diagnosis through the memory clinic network that will be national. So we should see some, hopefully, some interesting new statistics and outcomes on that within the next, you know, couple of years or five years, I'd say. Now, I know, you know, we've just said over 100 diseases with dementia. So I'm going to pick out one, and that is the, the poster child, um, the unfortunate poster child of dementia, and that's Alzheimer's disease. You know, I gather there's certain variants with this as well, but the overarching etiology that seems to be still accepted, although am I right that it's questioned? Is that the amyloid plaque and the neurofibrillary tangles? <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Okay, yeah. so, so um, <laughs> is this being questioned? Definitely, right. yeah, 100%. And, but, you know, I think it's becoming more and more common and more and more well accepted by the majority of the community researching Alzheimer's disease that we are looking at something that goes well beyond amyloid. And the thought now is that amyloid is probably a, an innocent bystander in the pathophysiological cascade as opposed to being the primary cause of 
of what's going on. Right. An innocent mm. bystander or a, a marker, a, like a yeah. marker that something else is going on? Yeah, it's, it's a marker that the disease is there, definitely. Yeah. But in terms of its role in in the cascade, in, in causing the neurodegeneration yeah. and in the beginning of that cascade, it, it really is, that's really is a hot debate at the moment. Yeah, so it, in my mind, it's kind of like blaming calcium for atherosclerotic plaques, you know? It's, in a way, yeah. It, yeah, it yeah. seems to be like, well, calcium is actually trying to protect you there. But um, it's just trying to wall off a, a an insult. But um, it could well crack, and you've got a problem. Is is calcium the problem? No, the problem is that you had a plaque there that was growing because of some inflammatory process. Um, Precisely. So it's a okay. very it's, a, it's an excellent analog. Exactly. Okay. So let's go on to that inflammation. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's the cause, quote unquote, of everything. Mm. But but why dementia? Why what's happening in these people's brains that causes dementia in them, and you know, not dementia in somebody else that may still have inflammation. You know, what what do they think? Of, what are the theories around the the triggers, the antecedents? Mm. It's really interesting, and and from from you know the perspective of dementia and Alzheimer's disease specifically, our poster child, as you called it, and also vascular dementia. Ah, is that, yes. Yeah, which is our second most common cause of dementia. Inflammation is really having a key role around the pathogenesis and then the the cascade, so what actually drives the neurodegeneration. And we're really starting to think that this pro-inflammatory environment in the brain is what's driving the neurodegeneration long-term right. and causing these long-term changes. Right. Like I understand the prevalence of dementia and Alzheimer's is exploding and that we've got a real healthcare crisis on our hands. Right. Um, mm. But is it concordant with the atherosclerotic issues that we're seeing in, you know, our burgeoning waistlines and, and our diabetes? Is it concordant with that or is there something else going on? It is concordant with that, and there is something else going on as well. So I think it's both things. Right. Uh, one is concordant in that there are so many common risk factors for right. for inflammatory diseases in general, and also a bit specifically around cardiovascular de- disease and dementia. There's just such a wide array of common risk factors, and I'll I'll talk about those in a bit more detail. Um, the other aspect that's kind of it's, it is and it isn't unique, but it's something that we need to sort of think about um, with a bit more thought, and that's around advancing mm-hmm. age because age we know is our biggest risk factor for dementia. And as we get older, which we're doing in an, in, in an ageing population in Australia, then more and more of us are at risk of right. developing, developing dementia. So, yes, cardiovascular risk disease also increases with age, but I think you'll see that dementia is is um, is really being driven by the fact that we're all living longer and maybe not so healthily and so well as we get older. And we're living with chronic disease. Okay, so here's exactly. a, a statistical projection. If there was a study saying, and I think it was probably around about five years ago now, saying that mm. this generation is going to be the generation that lives the longest and the subsequent generations will not live as long. Does that mean, therefore, that the prevalence of dementia might actually decrease because they're going to be living less or is the problem going to be that they're living with chronic diseases for a longer period of time? Yeah, I think it's that the the incidence will eventually decline. Right. Um, so that's the number of new cases being diagnosed. But whilst we've got uh, this big fat group of older people Fat being meant in two ways. Fat being meant in that there's a lot of older people and also that the waistlines are increasing. Yeah. Um, as they're moving into their 60s and 70s and and, and beyond in some cases, um, then we're seeing that the prevalence is remaining high. So whilst there might be a decline in the – so the prevalence is the number of people in the population who have the disease and the incidence is the number of new cases being diagnosed. Mm, so gotcha. incidence, I think, will see drive down, um, you know, in the future, but prevalence is going to remain high. We're still going to see that – large number of people um, going through with dementia because of our ageing population. The yep. baby boomers getting into their yeah, 60s, 70s, 80s. Where is the field at the moment with regards to finding a cure for dementia? And is that indeed just too big of an ask? Oh, well, no, I don't think it's too big of an, uh, an ask because I, I, don't, I don't believe it's time to lose hope just yet. I think that we're still still 
working on a viable treatment option. And I think that we, or options, I should say, I think there's multiple mechanisms that we can explore that we can target for disease. But yeah. if you look at the recent history, you know, there's been 146 failed attempts of Alzheimer's disease drugs wow. over the last 20 years. It's a lot, right? And so I think we need to learn from our mistakes. You know, there's there's several key factors that really underpin these failures. One is that we're aiming too late in the disease progression. So by the time someone's diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, you know, we know that there's 10 to 20 years plus in some cases of pathology that's built up in the brain. Right. So you're really looking at saying, oh, let's try and treat the symptoms of a disease that, you know, it's it's kind of, it's, it's gone, it's too late. You've missed the window of opportunity. Too little, too late. Another factor is around the fact that these treatments that have been used, they really only target one single therapeutic target or mechanism of the disease. So, you know, the obvious one at the moment is, is looking at our... Um, you know, NMDA receptor antagonists or our acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which is the two primary um, Alzheimer's disease treatments that are available on the market. Yeah. And they address one, each of them address one aspect of pathophysiology, where we know that it's such a complex disease with multiple mechanisms. You know, we're talking about obviously amyloid and tau, but we're also talking about oxidative stress. We're talking about inflammation. And just looking at one single aspect of the disease is not going to help with that. And the third part is that we're really only looking at things or in the past, these failures, is that we're just looking at treating the symptoms right. around the pathology. So acetylcholinesterate might improve cognition in the short term, but there's nothing around their mechanism that's actually going to stop disease progression or gotcha. delay it. Yeah. Um, or we're looking at things like amyloid that may be indirectly involved. Um, so, you know, we're, we're just not hitting... The mark, the mark, the mark. If you know what I mean, the right target. Yeah. So I think there's, you can look at the failures and go, yeah, we've we've really failed, and there's been a lot of lost dollars around investment. A lot of people's hope has been sort of shattered around finding a cure. But I think, you know, we're starting to learn that you need to be looking in a different direction. And that's around addressing this more complex pathophysiology. It's around looking earlier in disease progression. And it's also around um, targeting people in their 30s and 40s and doing risk reduction um, and lit improving dementia literacy so that we're reducing risk earlier on. Dementia literacy. Can you explain that yes. term for us, please? Yeah. So, you know, some of the things that we find with, with, with dementia is people tend to think it's a normal part of ageing, which it really isn't. It's beyond, well beyond a normal part of ageing. Right. So it's about understanding the causes of dementia and how much of your risk for dementia is actually modifiable. And it's a hmm. huge component. We're looking at well over a third percent of risk is modifiable. In Whoa. Australia, yeah, it's massive. So, you know, you've obviously got genetics and age, which are non-modifiable. But across the lifespan, you've got up to 35% risk um, that's modifiable. And in Australia, because we are obese, we are unhealthy, we do have you know, cardiovascular disease risk factors, et cetera, which put us at a higher risk of dementia. There's some statistics that suggest that our what we call our population attributable risk, which is modifiable risk, might be as close as 50%, which is staggering to think that if you can you've got, you know, almost a 50-50 chance <laughs> that you can reduce your risk of dementia. So, wow. yeah, I think, you know, improving our understanding of that uh, from an earlier age because it is an across-the-lifespan approach that we do need to take yeah. for dementia risk reduction, that that can really help drive down the, the future prevalence. Every now and again you'll see a paper coming out saying, you know, they've found an early target or an early marker of dementia. Right. How's this going? What what what's happening in this field? Is it is it, um, you know, done and dusted? Where we know what to identify and we can do this now as a, dare I say the word, screening or you know early detection? Oh. Or are we just oh, goodness, sort of goodness, no, no, yeah, no we're so far off this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> so, where are yeah, we at? What's look, happening? Yeah, look, one of the issues with this is, um, you know, I, I meant I sort of touched on this previously briefly and that's around the pathology building up yeah. 20 years plus in the brain yeah. before there's any clinical signs and you know so if you're starting to say oh look this person's got a problem with their memory and looking for the clinical presentation it, it, it really is too late almost by that point so you need to be going much earlier before there's any form of um 
clinical manifestation and deterioration in someone's memory and thinking. So that means that you've got to look at things like blood biomarkers, at brain biomarkers, things from this maybe from the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, or from you know urine, feces, etc. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where we're focusing from the biomarker perspective. A lot of the work's been done around amyloid, unfortunately, to date. Um, which again, you know, we've talked about the issues with done. that. Mm. Our, our innocent bystander. So now we're leaning more towards looking at things that are related to um, the inflammation pathway, for instance. So not just detecting things like pro-inflammatory cytokines, which we know are elevated in people with Alzheimer's disease. So things like our interleukin-6 and interleukin-1 beta and TNF-alpha. But we're also looking at things like tryptophan metabolism. So understanding wow. how, how uh, you know, the switch from processing tryptophan and it being metabolized into things like, you know, serotonin and melatonin and how if that's being drived into a different pathway, that that might lead to inflammation. So we can look a bit earlier on in the disease progression and trajectory to try and understand other ways. And, you know, that's just one approach. There's there's many, many, many different you know, minds approaching this from, from different angles, trying to look for early markers. Mm. Changes in, you know, in brain structure and function are another, is another thing, and that's sort of something that we're looking at as well to see if there's ways that the um, the white matter tracts in the brain, uh, both the structure and the function, are uh, being affected earlier on, and if that's something that we can look at. Even tau, which we know, you know, is more closely, so the tau protein is more closely correlated with cognitive decline than amyloid. Looking at tau hyperphosphorylation, I can never say that word properly, no, it's okay. is, um, and how tau is spreading through the brain. We think that's starting as early as in our 20s and 30s possibly, um, and looking at maybe markers for that in the brain and how that's projected through from the locus ceruleus uh, in the brain stem all the way up to the cortex and how that might be you know, a future marker for for disease progression later on. Right. So there's lots lots of different approaches. Not we don't have anything solid yet, but we we're, we're still I think we're moving in the right direction and looking at things beyond amyloid, which is the most important. Right. A little just a little question on the on tau. Um, mm. I have in my mind the prions of, you know, variant C CJD, um, mm. Kreuzfeldt jakob disease, mad cow disease, the colloquialism. Is tau related to a prion in the way that it works or acts? Or, and the second part of that question is, is there any way amongst the hodgepodge of biochemistry that we might be able to look at a secretion of tau in mm. urine? From urine, yeah. Mm. I don't think we're as far as urine yet. Um, so, yes, in terms of both amyloid and in terms of tau, in terms of it being, I guess, related to to things like Kreutzfeldt-Jakob because we're looking at it's it really is prion-like activity that we're seeing in right. those two proteins. So it's the, it's the misfolding of those proteins and things that go wrong and then they build up inside, um, you know, inside the brain. So... I, I think I mentioned before about looking at cerebrospinal fluid. That's kind of one of our, you know, I guess ways of looking at what's going on in the brain because yeah. it obviously crosses the blood-brain barrier, yeah. which is it gives us kind of a bit of a measurement for what's going on in there. Um, that's one way of looking at it without carving into people's brains directly. And things like the blood as well, but the issue with the blood and things like the urine is because you're looking at something that's circulating in the body or something that's being you know, metabolised and going through the urinary tract, it's mm. not necessarily going to be crossing the blood-brain barrier. No, that's right. You know, and giving the best picture about what's going on there. So I think, um, you know, you can look for more downstream markers in the blood and in the urine, and that's probably a better approach than looking directly for the proteins. Yeah. Yes. Themselves. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But even then yeah. you've got the hodgepodge of biochemistry going on in the whole body and you're looking Precisely. at the urine to track what's going on in one organ, which has got a yeah. casing around it called the blood brain barrier. What exactly. about, what about radio labeling things to check tau, say with neuroimaging? Um, yeah, yep. you know, obviously you've got to get the medicine in and if you're not going to do a, a spinal tap, you know, then you've got to look at something that crosses into the blood brain barrier. Is that mm, possible? Right. Is that any area? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely is. So um, you, one of the things I mentioned, yeah, at the beginning around our um, our brain scanning is, is amyloid PET, and we do tau PET as well, just not so much in Australia. It's A lot of it's done in the US in the right. life trials and cohort studies that are done there. But we can, we've got radioactive ligands that we can tag for amyloid and for tau and, and image those things. There's also FDG PET, which is, you know, looking at glucose metabolism in the brain. And the other one that's kind of just starting to hit off is looking at there's a, a ligand, I believe the guys at Anstel are working on this to look at inflammation. So there's a few a few options there, but the amyloid and tau PET scanning's been around for been around for some time now. And one of the other questions I had with regards to tracking a possible um, causative factor would be longitudinal studies, because you've got to be able to track dementia over years, right? That's right. You know, there are quite a few longitudinal studies and cohorts across the world looking at people. And, okay. you know, there's some excellent resources building up, like in the UK, for instance, with the Biobank, that's yep. looking at people, you know, through their 40s, 50s and so on. And then, you know, by the time we get to 10, 20 years' time, we're going to have multiple waves of data from these people that's going to be really helpful with all the imaging and the blood markers we get from them. There's other cohorts like the Diane cohort, which is looking at um, people who have the APP mutation for Alzheimer's disease. So this is the familial type of Alzheimer's disease, which is relatively uncommon compared to what we see with what we call late late sporadic Alzheimer's disease, which is, occurs in 99% of cases. The familial Alzheimer's disease, which is sort of 1% to 2% of cases, is when people have this genetic mutation that basically causes them to develop Alzheimer's quite early on, actually, 30s, 40s, 50s, rather than what we see, you know, typically, which is over the age of 65 and yeah. 70. yeah. So, so, so we do follow those people quite closely because that gives us a good. We know they're going to get it, so mm. it's sort of more cost effective in a way of, <laughs> of, um, of, of, of measuring longitudinal change yeah. in, in in people, and we've got quite a lot of data on them. But again, you know, there's questions around the similarity in terms of the pathogenesis of the people who carry this genetic mutation and people who have late. Uh, onset sporadic Alzheimer's. And to give you an idea, you know, our mouse model, one of our common mouse models, I should say, that's used to test new Alzheimer's drugs is the APPS1 transgenic mouse model. And that model has been basically formed based on this familial Alzheimer's disease. And so there's some people in the community are saying, well, one of the reasons our drug trials have failed is that we're looking at treating Late onset sporadic with Alzheimer's, which is yeah, with with a different a different you know with the familial type. So yeah. it may be that there's a disconnect there between the preclinical work that's been done around drug discovery and what's that, what we're actually trying to treat in in real world patients. Right, because I was going to ask you about you know with the APP mutation, what mm. evidence is there that we can actually stave off the beginning of dementia symptoms or Alzheimer's symptoms in these patients? Well, there's some there's some work that's being done in trials around around base inhibitors and things like that. But I think you know it's it's one of those things where it's all targeting amyloid. Yeah. Um. You know, an amyloid generation. I just I just I still feel like we're just hitting the wrong target, yeah. and we need to be looking at other things. With regards to herbal medicine, like when you're talking about radio labeling, you know, certain drugs, for instance, yeah. um, or markers so that you can neuroimage them. Uh, what about radio labeling a herbal medicine? Is that the way that the RMIT guys did their work on Bacopa? Uh, so the Swinburne guys. Um, the Swinburne, no, so sorry, it, I said yeah, RMIT, no, forgive okay. me. No, no, that's okay. Um, so, so no, it's not quite what they did um, because they're looking at, at, at neuronal function, gotcha. which is measured, yeah, using looking at the electrical activity of the brain. So you're, you're measuring this... Um, uh, what we call it, a summation of all of these post-synaptic potentials. So it gives you an idea about synaptic function, but it won't tell you about um, the different, say, you know, concentrations of, of, of herbal metabolites in the brain. Right. Um, so so it gives you a different different aspect of it. But, you know, there's, there's work that we're doing at the moment, for instance, at Western Sydney University, that where we're testing things like you know, traditional Chinese herbal medicine and also yeah. in our trial that we're going to be starting soon looking at medicinal cannabis. And what we t intend to do in that study and, and in the ones that we're currently doing is, yes, we measure all of our classic 
clinical outcomes for the trial, which are important in showing in intervention efficacy. You know, do they improve memory and thinking? Yes. And then we also measure the brain function, like what our Swinburne guys have done. So is it actually changing synaptic function? And then what we'll do is run some pharmacokinetics analyses. So looking right. at the plasma concentration of different metabolites of these herbal medicines in the blood, and we can correlate that with the changes we're seeing in the brain function and the changes we're seeing in the clinical outcomes with memory and thinking. And that gives us quite a, a powerful way of saying that any changes that we're seeing are due to the intervention that's being delivered rather than to some other cause. You were talking about cannabis potentially helping cognition. The stereotype mm. would be that cannabis dulls the senses, you know, is somniferous, that sort of thing. You're talking about helping cognition and helping people to think by using cannabis products. That's correct. Yes, it's very counterintuitive, isn't it? Absolutely. And, yeah, and I think one of those things comes down to, you know, some a, some very well ingrained stereotypes yes. about cannabis. Yeah, yeah, obviously, you know, THC is the bad the bad brother, you know, and, and CBD is the good brother. And if you have too much THC, it means that you're going to be impaired. And look, there's, there is, there obviously are some elements of truth to that, because if you're taking THC, you are going to have some psychoactive effects that will cloud memory and thinking. But, you know, it's about looking at beyond um, just the psychoactive effects, because there's lots of therapeutic properties of other cannabinoids. Um, yes. And when you combined, combine multiple cannabinoids together, the synergistic effects that you get between them can help to improve cognition. In We know in mice it can, so in our transgenic mouse model. And we also know that in humans who have um, a chronic, uh, chronic cannabis use and already have impaired cognition, when we give people like that cannabidiol, so CBD, yep. then we see an improvement in their cognition. Right. So it's um it's quite interesting actually because it's 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 counterintuitive, isn't it? You think that if you have cannabis, you're going to get worse. I thought I knew about cannabis, and a very quick discussion with uh, Justin Sinclair revealed that I did not. <laughs> 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 Justin's amazing. He's a wealth of knowledge. But, in but this you area. know, I, I and I and I wasn't against it. I was favourable to it, and, but I didn't know about it. Mm. Now you would you were just alluding to something that's really interesting to me. There, you're saying people with long chronic cannabis use who had dulled senses, and they increased CBD, not THC, and that increased their alertness. Could it mm. be therefore that the problem with our stereotypical view of cannabis was that? we're using the wrong sort of cannabis from the illicit drug trade. Potentially, potentially. Right. Right. I think um, what was interesting about that study is that they actually did a subgroup analysis. So they looked at people who were high and low users of cannabis. Yeah. And what they showed is that when they gave them CBD over 10 weeks, it was actually the people in the high usage group that had the improved cognition. And there's two arguments around that that I think that are interesting. One is that they had a bigger kind of room for improvement because yeah. they could have had more severe deficits to begin with because they're, you know, smoking more street weed or whatever. Yep. But the second argument, which I think is probably the most compelling one, is that these guys are actually consuming, yes, your street sort of based cannabis, which typically has a higher THC mm. content because, you know, you, that people want to get consume high. It. Yeah, exactly. They want to get high. So, you're looking at something, they're already having more THC, and then when you give them CBD, on top of that, there's something that goes on when you combine the two together that gives you a better bang for your buck in terms of therapeutic value. Right. So, and that that's the bit that I think is the most interesting. So, they're not 100% sure if that's what drove the results, but we're sort of leaning towards that might be what's happened, and, and that's kind of something that we're thinking about replicating in our in our future study, looking at people who have early stage Alzheimer's disease. And what about the entourage effect? The you know the the um, terpenes, the flavonoids, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's lots of evidence there around around the therapeutic efficacy of different uh, cannabinoids. So you know, for instance, that you know terpenes, um, you know they've been 
you know, implicated in Alzheimer's pathology and also in, in symptoms. Uh-huh. You've got, you've got um, you know, things like um, uh, symptoms of, of Alzheimer's, like depression. We think that things like limonene might be useful for that with the aggressive symptoms you see later, later on, things like linalool. Um, you know, so there's, there's a range, even um, amyloid plaque formation, there's, there's things implicating things like THCA. So a range of different cannabinoids. Right. Things implicated in various aspects of pathophysiology, but also in terms of the um, the clinical outcomes as well. Another one that comes to mind is um, the alpha pinning pin- alpha and how that's yep. related to memory as well. So gotcha. I, think, I think, you know, looking at – if you're just taking this narrow approach and saying, well, we've got this amazing plant that's got all of these different potentially therapeutic components – and then just taking one of them and either making it synthetically or just giving people high dose of that only, we might be missing the picture. And, in, you know, we've talked about what's gone wrong in the trials that have failed for Alzheimer's disease drugs. I think we've got to avoid going down that yeah, path. Yeah, don't again. do it again. <laughs> exactly. Let's just take one thing because we know what its mechanism is and see how it works. Yeah. Actually, that's a bit of a reductionist approach. Yeah. And I think we might be missing the bigger picture. Humans yeah. aren't good at looking at complex interactions, are we? <laughs> No, and look, the scientific paradigm is we're just not set up to test that, you know, and even personalised medicine where everybody's built differently, we all metabolise differently, we need different ratios and doses of things, you know, the scientific paradigm around clinical trials is just not designed to test those kind of effects. And it's a real shame because if you think about how modern medicine works, you know, if you go in Australia today to be prescribed cannabis, which is it's challenging at best, but say you've got chronic pain and and go and visit a a GP who's a a registered prescriber, they're not just going to give you a standard formulation. They're going to try out a few different things, different ratios. They're going to titrate the dose. You know, they're going to just find the sweet spot for you, what works. And, you know, I think, Thinking about personalised medicine approaches like that, that's probably going to be the way of the future um, for cannabis. But hopefully we're also testing things like, you know, metabolites and how we're actually, you know, metabolising things and how our body's responding to it um, at a more biochemical level and not just going, well, do you feel better? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. So tell us a little bit more about the trials that you're running for mild cognitive impairment and dementia. Mm. So we've got one trial that's almost finished now, actually. So this one was NHMRC funded and it's looking at Siluotong SLT, which is a traditional Chinese medicine formula that's been specifically developed for vascular dementia. And what I love about SLT is it's, um, it's, it's, I, I call it a drug because it's not sort of what you would think of if you go, oh, well, TCM, okay, traditional Chinese herbal medicine, I've got, you know, I'm going to go and see a a Chinese herbal medicine practitioner and get a a mix of herbs and I'll go and make them up and take them. It's been developed like any drug in a Western medicine paradigm would have been developed. So Mm -hmm. through the full drug discovery pathway. So all of its, you know, its chemical composition has been well established. The ratio of the three different herbs. So it contains ginkgo, ginseng, and saffron. The ratio has been very well defined and tested in preclinical studies. We know how, you know, its toxicology profile has been tested. We know what dose we should be taking. It's all been done over the last 15 years. And it's currently at the point where they're in phase three trials for vascular dementia. So wow. They're doing studies in China. Yeah, and we've got a phase three under, underway here, also at Nikon at Western Sydney University, looking at vascular dementia. And so taking that approach that I was talking about before, was saying, are we looking too late in the disease trajectory? We thought, let's look a bit earlier in in that disease pathway and target people with mild cognitive impairment and see if SLT is going to have an effect on them. And people with MCI are a really fantastic patient group to look at because they have problems in memory and thinking. So they are, a, MCI is a clinical syndrome. You know, you can go to a to a specialist and be diagnosed with MCI, as tricky as that can be. It's, it's something you can measure. But people with MCI don't 
have any impairment in their function and independence yet. They're still able to adopt different strategies to help them deal with the memory impairment. So they're able to comply to treatment really well and they don't necessarily need a carer to kind of help them with things. So they're a really engaged group um, to work with, but they also are this sort of what I call the window of opportunity. They're at an earlier stage where you might be able to do something and actually improve cognition and possibly delay deterioration in the future. So that's one of the studies we're looking at is is SLT and and we're about 80% of the way through that one. We're going to finish that one at the end of the year or sort of January 2020 at the latest. Wow. Very exciting. Very exciting. really excited. Yeah, and I can't tell any results yet because we're not allowed to underline until we're we're finished. So as much as I want to look, (laughs) I can't. I can't. I've been doing some kind of across groups analysis and it looks like there's some trends towards improvement in what we call episodic memory, which is our ability to be able to remember kind of episodes or events in life. Um, and that's like the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, but that's a cross group. So we don't know if it's a placebo-driven effect or if it's something that the treatment is actually driving, but it's there. Gotcha. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to see that. I can just see you champing at the bit going, I want to break the code, I want to break the code. I want to... <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, yeah. But no, I can't. I don't have the code, so I can't break it. That's for someone else. So <laughs> the temptation's not there. Uh, and you were mentioning a cannabis trial just before yes that's right yeah yeah, yeah. Is that- so that's still yeah that's still in develop at the development at the moment but we're really excited about that one which will um which will launch next year sometime so that's all secret squirrel right now and i can't tell you too much about exactly what we're doing but we are looking at cannabis for people with mci so again it's in this earlier disease stage um so we're we're super excited about that we think we've got a great protocol we've got a fantastic team of international experts that are going to drive this wow. and i'm really you know out of all the things i'm looking at yes i'm excited about slt of course um but i really feel like this might be might be one of the it could be the winning ticket but we don't know yet we yeah don't know. like we can only hope and it's not yeah exactly. like for me for me it's not for cannabis it's for these patients that are suffering and they, indeed their families exactly. And, and they're people that they interact with who are suffering. They're carers. They're all suffering together. Um, and if we can help them with something, I, I, I don't care if it's herbal or whatever. I don't care if it's a drug. No. I just would love to see this group of patients being helped because, as you say, 146 failed drug attempts over 40, 40 years. 20 it's not years, a, 20 years. 20 years. It's not a good track record. I can only hope that this shows some sort of succour um, some help for these patients who are really suffering. Yes, yes, me too, Andrea. That's honestly to tell you that is the driving point of what we do. You know, where every aspect of the research that we do is about trying to find a way to help these people. And, you know, it's it's because all of us have been touched by dementia in some way. You know, you think about things like cancer as well it's very Mm. similar i'm sure you know and and most of the people you work with it's the same with us we all know somebody who has dementia um you know grandparent a parent an aunt an Mm. uncle you know a friend there's just so many people out there who are um experiencing these difficulties and whatever we can do to help people and if there's a way to stop it from happening to begin with then that you know i'm all for that Dr. Genevieve Steiner, I can't thank you enough for your care for your patients and indeed the care for future generations who suffer from this debilitating Ill- these debilitating illnesses. Thanks so much for joining us on FX Medicine today. Thanks for having me, Andrew. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Dr. Genevieve Steiner will be presenting her Dementia Prevention Webinar for the Australian Traditional Medicine Society on the 3rd of March, 2020. For more information and to book your ticket, go to atms.com.au and click on the events tab.